Ahí va. So I believe you are live right now. Uh, Perfect. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kamal Erkan. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Isaiah Zair now. Uh, we are um, the um, Friends of Tigray in Delaware. Uh, this is our third session and we are gonna discuss the um, Ethiopia and Tigray conflict and what's happening today in Tigray. Uh, again, uh, my name is Kamal Erkan and I am the chairman of United Medical ACO. Uh, Dr. Egan, if you can please introduce yourself. Thank you, Kamal. Um, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Irgao. I am the president of the Christiana Institute of Advanced Surgery. I specialize in uh, uh, minimally invasive weight loss surgery. And I'm uh, very happy to be here today to discuss uh, this uh, extremely important topic of the uh, great humanitarian crisis that is unfolding uh, in the Horn of Africa in the northern part of Ethiopia in the region of Tigray. So uh, Dr. Rigal, uh, many people, they probably don't understand what I'm doing in this video. So uh, I do wanna make sure that everyone is uh, kind of like on the same, we are on the same page. So uh, we are, uh, uh, Dr. Rigal and I, we are running uh, a, an accountable care organization. Eventually, uh, eventually what it is is that uh, we are trying to make the public health much better in the state that we live in. Now we take this responsibility to a different level and um, it's been almost uh, 18, 19 years we've been working together. And one of our goal was uh, that we were gonna have a nonprofit uh, medical institution in uh, Ethiopia uh, mm -hmm. to honor Dr. Erdogan's dad. And uh, that was, uh, I remember when I called Dr. Erdogan, um, uh, I was actually in Turkey uh, on one of my vacations and, uh, like small trips and the uh, issue, like when I told you, I'm like, why don't we do this? So, and that's where we started. And my interest is of course, through that area, but I do have a personal interest to make uh, the society that we live in much better, not just the zip code that we live in or the state we live in or the, the nation that we live in, but the uh, overall, the, uh, the, the earth that we are uh, kind of responsible for in, in, a, in, a, in a way. So. Uh, we are going to actually just bring up um, what it is that we are doing today uh, and why we are doing it. And we actually just take you guys to, uh, to the beginning of this. Um, now, in the first two uh, session, we did not have a, uh, we, didn't, we didn't have a setup for um, Friends of Tigray, uh, Delaware. Right now, we, are, uh, we have our name uh, already reserved and we are in the middle of incorporating this and it will be uh, run by Dr. Irga and myself. And the, again, the issue with the first two, uh, what we have done, it got so much, uh, I didn't expect, because we do this for business. And in many cases we have to do, uh, we have to promote what we do. Um, and uh, unfortunately this uh, topic is not uh, available for, um, for promotion. So I didn't think we were gonna get so many uh, views and both videos, uh, we got over uh, 2,600 for each, which is a pretty uh, good number to achieve. That means there are a lot of people who have interest in what we are talking about here uh, and what we can actually learn. And many of you know that I had uh, brought this up last time. And you know I do wanna kind of just say this, I wasn't really trying to target this little teenager here, but I was trying to make this teenager's voice a lot uh, louder because this is supposed to be the equal opportunity. It shouldn't be about the color of our skin or it shouldn't be which country we live in. Uh, everyone should have a voice and this person is real. This person has real issues. And since the last time we had this uh, presentation, nothing changed. Perhaps she died. So we do wanna uh, thank uh, our Senator Chris Coons. Actually, it was a little bit late, but this morning I invited him for our live session, but of course it was kind of late and he's, um, uh, he was uh, busy for today, but I'm, I'm hoping that he would be 
participating in one of our uh, future sessions. Uh, and also we have a new uh, Secretary of State, uh, Anthony Blinken, uh, and we do want to thank him for his support on this issue. Uh, Dr. Uh, if you would like to share this with us. Absolutely. So essentially, uh, the Secretary of State uh, uh, Blinken actually called the Ethiopian Prime Minister uh, Abiy Ahmed and uh, as his tweet says, he expressed concern about the crisis in Tigray and he urged unhindered humanitarian access to prevent further loss of life. Uh, of life. And that is exactly what we're saying, Kamal, because you, know, you said since the last uh, broadcast that you and I did, nothing has changed, right? Nothing has changed because again, no access has been available for humanitarian assistance for the 6 million people of Tigray who are trapped without any way of exiting. There is a blockade of information, which means that phone, internet are still scarce or unavoidable for the large portion of Tigray, which means that there is no way for the world on the outside to understand the scale of the devastation that is occurring. We know there is devastation because bombs are still falling. A foreign army from Eritrea is still wreaking havoc everywhere it sets foot into, right? But the actual damage literally is not coming out to us, right? We don't know. And not only we don't know, the help that is needed to go there is not getting there. So I absolutely agree with you. We should be thanking Secretary of State Blinken for really pressing on this issue when talking to Prime Minister Abiy, who essentially is in charge of Ethiopia, is in charge of the people of Tigray. And yet, not only he's waging war on them, but he's also denying the help that these people need to get fed, to get water, to get medicine, to get shelter, very, very basic needs, not only for one person, for one village, but for 6 million people. Sure, uh, Dr. Gal, um, because we mentioned uh, the both issues in a couple different, uh, I mean, not both issues, in two sessions, we um, tried to capture what was happening, but I still have some questions and I prepare a couple slides for us to kind of go through, but you don't have to stick to that. Uh, I want you to just educate us why we are here and if there was anything behind uh, the scene, like even before 2020. Uh, so I have seen uh, some of the, um, uh, some of these other articles that, um, let me actually just share this so that, um, I still have questions, like it seems like it's not something new. This was something coming before and if maybe if that's the case, it's not the case, if you can kind of uh, walk us through this and then, um, uh, then we can better understand the situation. Absolutely, Kamal, it's, um, it's, it's important to look into this, right? Very many of the people who may be following this broadcast today may remember Ethiopia because there were news about large scale famines occurring in that country in the 70s and in the 80s, right? In the 70s, we had Emperor Haile Selassie who totally ignored this looming famine that was occurring uh, in uh, Ethiopia. And uh, once this became public, one of the reasons the emperor was overthrown was actually because of the widespread uh, protests that occurred after that famine, right? After the emperor was overthrown, we had a military regime come to power in Ethiopia, which was a brutal dictatorship that was ruling with an iron fist. Um, and then obviously there were opposition uh, movements that started all over Ethiopia. And it is those opposition movements, particularly the one that really developed inside Tigray that led to the overthrow of this military government. And during the military government in the 80s, we did have another very large scale famine as well come up. And that make people may remember, for instance, uh, the movement that was started by Bob Geldof from Ireland when he had uh, uh, one Christmas, he had actually 
uh, a lot of other uh, international uh, well-known stars to sing together to try to raise funds. So this is how Ethiopia was known in the 70s and in the 80s. After the overthrow of the military regime in 1991, as you can see on the top uh, line of your slide here, we had a new government come up, a government that was led actually by the Tigray People's Liberation Front, which is incidentally the movement that is now at odds with the current Ethiopian government. And they formed a coalition and they really set Ethiopia on a completely different path, right? Actually, Ethiopia was one of the few countries that was supposed to reach the millennium goals of the United Nations in terms of reduction of poverty, achievement, lowering of infant mortality, increasing literacy levels throughout the country. They managed to do that. They were single-minded in their determination to lift millions of Ethiopians of poverty, right? Now, there were problems during their tenure, like any other country, because it's a complex country, but they managed to do that. And if that path had continued, Kamal, if that path had continued, within a very short period of time, Ethiopia could have come out completely from any future danger of famine, right? That was the path they set it at, right? Well, we had changes, right? Going, uh, coming in 2018, we had changed. The ruling party that was led by the TPLF was uh, pushed out and Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came to power, right? And he was hailed internationally because he was talking about some bold reforms that he was going to undertake, right? And yet, what we saw unfolding was an attempt to go back to the old ways of a centralized government really ruling Ethiopia without consent, ruling Ethiopia with an iron fist. Who opposed him on this? The TPLF, right? The, uh, who was the, that, uh, the regional government in Tigray? They opposed him. One of the first things that Abiy Ahmed did, uh, as you and I talked in our previous sessions, is he decided, for instance, that he was going to postpone the elections because of the pandemic. That was one point of friction with the TPLF, with the Tigray regional government, right? Because they felt that he was not elected, he had no mandate to postpone the election, and the friction started from there. Well, in Tigray, within the regional government, the Tigray regional government did conduct the election in the middle of the pandemic. It is ironic, Kamal, that on the one hand, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed decided that the pandemic was too much for him to be able to conduct an election, and yet the pandemic was okay for him to conduct this devastating war. It makes no sense, and yet that's where we are. Now, I talked about famine, right, as I took you through those 70s and 80s, right, Kamal? Now, we have an impending famine now but it's not like the famine in the past. This is man-made. This is caused by the war. And that's what we're talking about. People really losing lives, losing their life in Tigray right now because they have no access to food. It's very tragic. So Dr. Rigo, I think um, uh, for those who are listening to us, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I did tell you this uh, in the beginning, uh, the point of the, the, where this problem is coming from, right? So. This problem is coming from, okay, so the federal government is mandating something and that state is not listening. Now, fine, okay? The, let's say the state was wrong. Um, the punishment that we are actually uh, talking, right? That's the part that we are kind of focusing. Is it uh, worth to kill your own people? So. I'm not like, I, can, I mean, I told you this and I, I don't have a problem saying this here. I don't know who's right, who's wrong and I'm not interested in that. If we have the same problem here, let's say if Delaware was trying to do this, would we just the federal government would kill all of us? Just because that's the, that's the, uh, that's the um, you know, um, we are not declaring the independent. So we just, ran through the uh, elections and we thought we were capable of doing it. And we did it, 2.4 million people did. And in the United States, 150 million people did the same thing. So that obviously federal government decision was actually wrong. 
But the state didn't follow that through. Fine, maybe that was wrong too. But this shouldn't be the consequences. Absolutely, absolutely. So the problem, obviously, is that once you decide to solve this in a military fashion, right, mm -hmm. and you use the country's military to come in, right, in their hundreds of thousands, accompanied by armored vehicles, accompanied by fighter jets, helped by drones borrowed from Middle Eastern countries. When you're doing that, you're not after a few regional government leaders, you're after the whole population. Because as you are shelling, as the soldiers are advancing, what you're doing is you are gonna be killing civilians, right? You're gonna displace them. You're gonna deprive them of their livelihood. And that's exactly what we've seen. Now, the situation is actually a lot worse than that, Kamal, because it's not only the federal government coming in from the South into Tigray, but it invited a foreign army from Eritrea in the North to come in as well. Eritrea has deployed 12 divisions to enter Tigray. And this is an army that has no accountability, right? And they have started shelling towns like Humara and Shire. And everywhere they went, we hear about devastation, the havoc they wreaked in Shire. As they proceeded towards the central part of Tigray, the destruction of factories like the cotton factory in Adwa. As they proceeded towards the eastern part of Tigray, the destruction of health centers like in Adigarat. Yes, you see those pictures, for instance. So not only they are coming well, I'm in. Right now, that we don't, like, let's just make sure people are able to follow. We didn't make these pictures up. So what I'm sharing right now is a hospital. It's a hospital. It's a right. hospital. And as you can imagine, Tigray being a, a country which is part of the underdeveloped world, healthcare is a very precious commodity. There is one hospital for hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people in some cases, right? So to come in and willfully destroy hospitals, right? If this is not war crime, I don't know what war crime is, come on, right? Because not only you are hurting, wounding, maiming people, but you're also preventing them from getting treatment. And there is no one aiding this civilian. And that's what we're talking about. That's why we are saying the world of decency, the world of compassion must act, not tomorrow after we hear that hundreds of thousands have perished. It must act now. It must act now in, in really forceful manner to hold this two government, the government of Ethiopia under Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, the government of Eritrea under President Isas, to hold them accountable because their own people have no power to hold these governments accountable. If that happens, the world from outside must intervene as it did finally in places like Bosnia, right? It was too late for Rwanda. It was too late for many people in Bosnia when the world reacted. We don't want it to be that way for Tigray Kamal. Kamal, when you and I talk and you ask me about whether I have heard from my relatives in Tigray, right? Still, particularly where the larger part of my extended family lives in central Tigray, in the Adwa region, I still have not heard. So when I am preoccupied and find it hard to sleep some nights. It's not only because the other side, the other end of the phone line is dead, it's quiet. It's also because I worry about what I will discover once this veil of darkness is lifted. What are we going to find out has been happening to this population under the uh, menace of this invading army from Eritrea and the Ethiopian army uh, uh, waging war on them, right? That, that's what worries me, uh, Kamal. And what we're saying is that the world must protect these civilians. They are trapped. 
Some of them have been able to run away and go into the Sudan, but the ones who have managed to do that are actually the ones who lived close to the border to the Sudan in the Humara region, in Western Tigray. How about in Central Tigray? How about in Eastern portion of Tigray? Where are they going to run into? They cannot run into Eritrea because the army from Eritrea is the one that is hunting them. They cannot run into the rest of Ethiopia because there is a blockade, complete blockade for any type of transportation from uh, the rest of Ethiopia into Tigray. So they are trapped. Now, not only they are trapped because they cannot run from this come out, but there are no provisions coming to them. There is no food being delivered. There are no medicines being delivered. Humanitarian organizations are saying, what kind of words does the world want us to use to express that there is dire emergency, right? So when you and I talk about this in our meetings about this come out, we say, how many zeros do we want after one in terms of people dying before we start seeing this continuously on CNN or NBC or ABC? How many zeros? How many people must die before the world acts and responds to this? You know, unfortunately, Dr. Brown, the answer to that is depends where they live. Absolutely. If Absolutely. they live in the Western countries, one means hundreds of people from Africa or the other countries. I mean, do we not see this all the time? There is a, you know, car bomb in uh, Iraq and, you know, 75 people die, no one cares. And then there's two Americans captured somewhere and then the, we are about to have start a war with Iran. Like, it depends where they live. And like, that's unfortunate, right? So Absolutely. your Absolutely. life is, has more meanings if you live in the United States. This is Absolutely. the... This is, this is why we are maybe actually holding this session because we are saying that no, every life is important. So now, um, the, you know, as we are going through this, so the stuff that we do, what, what bothers us most in this, uh, we have, this is not the first time this happened in the world, right? So this happened in so many times, in so many different mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. Now, Nobel uh, Peace Prize, um, certified this guy to kill people. So the reason we are not maybe acting, reacting fast enough is because he's certified by this uh, institution that recognizes for people for their extraordinary work. Peace. Absolutely. Peace Absolutely. is what this guy have. How many people die? Now, you know, Dr. Gal, uh, you do say this, but sometimes, you know, I have to kind of just make sure that it's heard loudly. There's no war right now, but we are actually, this, that stopped, right? So it already, damage is already done. Then you would try to actually, after that kind of damage, you would try to recover. So for the recovery, you need resources and those resources are being shut down. So then you are kind of forced to die. Then there's no war, we are not, you know, shooting you, but, we are not giving you food. We are not giving you medicine. We are not giving you water. So that part is the reason that we are still holding. So some, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, <laughs> I work with a lot of young people and, you know, sometimes they just read the headline and they're like, oh, it's over. The war is over. No, war is not over. It just started for those. Absolutely. Absolutely. So clearly the uh, forces loyal to the regional government of Tigray are fighting, not in the towns, but they are fighting in the countryside, right? And so the uh, two parties that are at war right now inside Tigray are the Ethiopian government and the Eritrean government on one side and the Tigray regional government on the other, right? Now, what we're saying is this, first of all, this was, war was totally unnecessary. And it can stop. It can stop right now if the prime minister of Ethiopia decides, okay, enough. I am going to be talking to the leaders of the regional government of Tigray, right? Talk to them, sit down with them. I am going to stop because I don't want any more people from Tigray to die, to be maimed, right? He could do that. He could tell the Eritrean troops to get out of Tigray to get out completely because that's not their country. 
right? We so could do that any minute. And what we are saying is we want the United Nations, we want the world of decency to precisely pressure this government to do that so lives could be saved. But Look, no, come on. Yeah. The, 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 the part of the, uh, you know, like it, it gets sometimes confusing for people who are listening. Mm -hmm. So what it means is that we are talking about Ethiopia, mm -hmm. right? and we are talking about the one of the states of Ethiopia called Tigray. Yep. Now, we introduced another name, Eritrea, which is a different country. Yes. Now, you know, unfortunately, many Americans don't know where these countries are. They, um, I can tell, I mean, I can put hundred dollars on the table that 80% of my friends from America don't know where Eric is. So it's a different sure. country. Now what sure. we are describing here is, so we are inviting this different country that we were in a war for a long time. We are inviting them down to kill our own people while we are supporting it from the South. They are supporting it from the uh, North and we are press, pressing them to die. Yes. So, trapping. They are yeah, in a trap. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So that's Absolutely. kind of like why this becomes um, interesting. So if you can actually tell us on the, oh, I'm going to bring this map up. Uh, so if you can, um, uh, people actually uh, can see these, these are from legit uh, resources, sources that uh, is being shared. These are nothing that we talk. I wouldn't put my name on it if I don't believe in uh, and if I'm not able to certify them. So like, I do go and uh, make sure that they are being uh, from the uh, reliable resources. But this is the Ethiopia uh, region. You know, that re it was funny the other day we were talking to uh, one of our hosts, uh, I mean, one of our guests, and um, I bet she didn't know uh, the Ethiopian's population. So this is the second most populated country in Africa. It's over hundred million. So the Tigray is over six, close to 7 million. Just on the election, they had like 2.4 million who were able to go and yeah. uh, you know, uh, vote. So yeah. can you just describe the situation here a little bit so that we can have a better idea? Absolutely. So to the Tigray region is, as you see, the northernmost region of Ethiopia, right? And the war is happening right here with troops coming from Ethiopia in the south in coming through this border here, and then troops coming from Eritrea through this border here, right? So this region is completely trapped. People have nowhere to go, right? And then, and then if they could escape, right? They could go to the Sudan, but only the people who live in the very Western portion of Tigray were able to do that. Otherwise, there are armies coming from the South, right? Armies coming from the north, right? And that's what they're doing right now for a small region, right? The government in Ethiopia is at odds with the regional government of Tigray. The government of Eritrea has been at odds with the leaders of Tigray for uh, at least 20 years, right? And under a guise of a peace agreement that was sanctioned by the Nobel Peace Committee, these two governments have formed a war pact and decided they needed to wipe out the regional government of Tigray, right? And they are doing that at the expense of the people of Tigray, where hundreds of millions now are in dire, dire emergency for lack of food, medicines, and other provisions. That's exactly what's happening. And yet, no one is bringing this up in a clear, loud voice. That's why you and I are doing this, Kamal. I mean, as you say it correctly, you are a very successful businessman who has been able to transform the healthcare landscape in the state of Delaware, right? And I work with you very closely. I'm a very uh, busy surgeon, very successful surgeon, right? I have a wonderful family. I have three children who are in very good colleges. My oldest daughter goes to Columbia. The other daughter goes to Harvard. I have a son who is going to Stanford, right? Very successful, very happy. It's a dream come true, right? But I cannot sleep at night knowing what is happening to people in Tigray.
come up. And that's exactly what you and I are doing. We are trying to raise awareness for the world to know that there is a hidden humanitarian crisis, a devastating crisis where 6 million people have been victimized. And we are trying to tell the world that. The world needs to hear us. There are enough decent people in the world, come on, that once they hear it, they will actually take it upon themselves to voice this so that governments in the world start acting with urgency. We know the United Nations Security Council has met last week to talk about Tigray. We have not heard of any resolutions, however, come up. And that worries me. Getting late, uh, the, the, I mean, what, what you were saying, how many zeros you need next to one is the key. So there will be something that's gonna be done, but how many people have to die to see that? Now, from our little effort from here, uh, we actually send a letter to the uh, Nobel Peace uh, Prize Committee. Uh, we emailed uh, the letter, we also overnight the letter. Uh, we have not heard, it, heard back from them, uh, but these are the things that we can do from our side. Uh, now, there will be more things that we can do. Uh, I know some people from here are putting some effort, but it's not enough. So it's not enough so that we need this to be expedited. We need, like, every day right now, like, uh, you know, it's snowing outside and then it's a, you know, uh, warm uh, household that we have. As you just said, we cannot sleep. We cannot actually enjoy our time because there are people um, who are not able to have these resources and it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't, it doesn't, so absolutely. It doesn't have to be until it hits one of our family members that we have to react to these types of things because these things are happening. Dr. Neil, this happened in the middle of Europe for so many years in Bosnia. Yep. So it was Bill Clinton finally kind of stepped up, but for how many people died before it got to a point where uh, it stopped? So we can Absolutely. stop this, it's not, it's not difficult, but no one should be blocking, in 2021, no one should be blocking the humanitarian help. United Nations should have a better voice or more effective voice or more effective um, way of helping. It shouldn't be just sending someone to tell us, yeah, people are dying there. I, I read what they actually published. I'm like, yeah, so like, if you are already telling us this is what's happening, why are we not acting on it? Absolutely. We have to move on. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have to move on quickly. So Absolutely. Uh, it's gonna to be too late and it's gonna be another shameful page in our history. It already is, but it's gonna become a bigger chapter. So uh, as you said, I mean, on a Sunday, uh, this is not what we wanna talk about, right? But we have no choice. I mean, because we have, we believe that we have responsibilities. Yes. And we are gonna, we are gonna, uh, we are gonna continue doing this until we see the resolution, right, Dr. Ga? Absolutely, absolutely. So for anybody who is listening, we want them to first of all uh, get interested in what's going on in Tigray. Write to their. Um, government representatives about their concern about the people of Tigray, try to contribute to any humanitarian effort to help the people of Tigray. Just because we are humans, just because we have decency, just because we have compassion, that's enough reason for us to want to do that. But if we don't know, we cannot do it. That's why this is important. That's why we have to, to be the voice for the voiceless come out. You know, it's, it's not a computer game, right? What's happening right now is real. So, um, Dr. Gunn, what was our guy from Stanford? His name was Dr. Um, uh, Spolsky, Sp the one. Um, Saponsky, Saponsky, yes. The, the, yeah, the um, anthropologist, right? So, one of his sessions, he was talking about how people like in California, they, uh, they actually have a job. Their job is through the uh, joysticks and drones that kill people on the other side of the world. And they come home and they have dinner with their family. With their, they, they send their kids to school and then they do their homework. So they are, during the daytime, they, you know, just like a computer game, they kill people on the other side of the world. And then I think 
I'm afraid that we are becoming like those people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But this is this is where it's going. So we are supporting this. Like every minute of this, uh, you know, uh, as I'm actually doing a little bit more research, this uh, little country, Djibouti, uh, it's like on the uh, uh, east of Ethiopia, obviously you know this. So yep. uh, there are a lot of stuff happening and I wonder how this is connected to that. Uh, and maybe another session we can talk about it. But Absolutely. There must be more than just someone uh, didn't follow the federal government's uh, order. So Absolutely. this is the way that it has to be. Uh, it has to be. So we need to actually put everyone's efforts, everyone's voice together. Uh, social media is huge uh, in terms of making your uh, impact. Uh, more people watch these, more people share these, more people uh, reach out to their state officials. Uh, so it's not just Dr. Ergan Kamal's show, it's everyone's show. So Absolutely. this is, these are people, you know, they're not related to me, right? So I don't have any uh, personal benefit from it. So I wish I can do more of these for others, but now this is closer to home. So Dr. Ergan's home and uh, therefore it's, uh, it's affecting us more. So, yep. but we, we have to be more uh, responsible for this. Now, Dr. Gao, anything else that we didn't mention for today? No, I think we, we are. I mean, the key issue is that, you know, as you say, nothing has changed since last time in terms of getting assistance to the people, but you and I know that more has changed because more people will have perished since we spoke last time. More people will have lost their homes and being displaced since we spoke last time. More parents will have lost their children. More children will have lost their parents. And that's unacceptable, come on. And that's, it's unacceptable just because it's hidden from us, because communication has been blocked from us. It doesn't mean we can ignore it. We have to be able to do something about it and do it now. Absolutely. And now we do everything from our side under the Friends of Tigray, uh, Delaware, which is a, a nonprofit organization we incorporated and uh, hopefully we'll be sharing more. Uh, we do have a page on Facebook. Uh, so these events we are going to share through that. Uh, and also from my YouTube channel, uh, people can actually uh, follow us through those. Uh, and thank you for listening uh, this and be, be part of the great call that we are trying to have. Uh, and hopefully next week, it will be a different time for those people who lost their homes, their uh, relatives, their families, we have to live in a better world and I'm hoping that this would be the last session that we have to do for this. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Kamal. Good night, everybody. Good night.